Welcome to Timeless Truth with Pastor Jim Thomas, a resource of the Village Chapel in Nashville, Tennessee. This week we'll be taking a deeper dive into the second chapter of Ephesians. What is the God of the Bible like? What has God done for us in Christ? In this chapter, the Apostle Paul presents us with a catalog of contrasts that leave us speechless in wonder and worship. We pray this study of the timeless truth of God's Word will give you a sturdier trust in our Lord this week. If you'd like to learn more about the Village Chapel, visit our website, thevillagechapel.com. Now, here's Pastor Jim. Good day, folks. Pastor Jim Thomas from the Village Chapel here in Nashville, Tennessee, with your daily devotion. We're walking through Ephesians, and each day, taking about 15, 20 minutes. Hope you've got a Bible. If not, if you're running or if you're driving to work or whatever, I'll be glad to read the text for you. And today, just taking three verses from chapter two. So if you want to turn there and uh, be ready to jump in, uh, also remind you, Uh, to subscribe if you have that opportunity, whatever platform you're uh, listening to or watching uh, this podcast. And uh, as well, you can download some show notes, which will have uh, uh, some of the quotes and uh, some of the study notes as we've gone along. I have, uh, I just want to read a couple paragraphs from this uh, commentary here by John Stott, one of my favorite Bible teachers over the last couple of decades. He's gone home to glory now, but he did a great job with the message of Ephesians. It's in the Bible Speaks Today commentary series. Uh, John was a pastor for a long, long time at All Souls Church there uh, in London. And uh, as I say, been one of my uh, heroes when it comes to Bible study and Bible teaching for uh, many, many years. I quote him often as I'd like to do right now. His uh, two paragraphs that open up sort of introduce, if you will, chapter two in these Um, By the way, chapter two is an amazing uh, chapter. It's all about uh, how we are made alive in Christ, but it begins with the need first. So the first three verses, which I'll read after I read uh, Stott's comments here, um, really describe sort of the before. Uh, You know, if there's a before and after, if there's a... uh, uh, sort of a you know bad news and good news to follow um, today. Anyway, we're going to at least hear the reality of the diagnosis, the proper diagnosis, and I think uh, it's hopeful because it gets us started in the right direction, looking for the answers in the right way. Here's what Stott says, uh, his introduction, as I say, to chapter two. He says, I sometimes wonder if good and thoughtful people have ever been more depressed about the human predicament than they are today. Of course, every age is bound to have a blurred vision of its own problems because it is too close to them to get them into focus. That's very perceptive of him and honest of him as well, I think, to say that. He goes on to say, every generation breeds new prophets of doom. Nevertheless, the media enable us to grasp the worldwide extent of contemporary evil. And it is this which makes the modern scene look so dark. It's partly the escalating economic problems, population growth, the spoilation of natural resources, inflation, unemployment, hunger, partly the spread of social conflict, uh, racism, tribalism, the class struggle, disintegrating family life, and partly the absence of accepted moral guidelines leading to violence, dishonesty, and sexual promiscuity. Man seems incapable of managing his own affairs or of creating a just, free, humane, and tranquil society. For man himself is askew, and I I'm going to bet that resonates with you as you stop just and think about the world around us and what's going on. A couple more sentences from Stott, and then we'll read our text. Against the somber background of our world today, Ephesians 2 stands out in striking relevance. Paul first plums the depths of pessimism about man and then rises to the heights of optimism about God. It is this combination of pessimism and optimism, of despair and faith, which constitutes the refreshing realism of the Bible. I love that phrase, the refreshing realism of the Bible. For what Paul does in this passage is to paint a vivid contrast between what man is by nature and what he can become by 
grace. All right. With that in mind from John Stott, let me read these first three verses here of uh, chapter two of Ephesians. Lord, before I read this scripture, Holy Spirit, come open our eyes, please. Um, uh, move in our hearts and our minds uh, in the way that only you can to help us see things we might not be able to see otherwise, to um, uh, arouse our curiosity for you and for your gift of redemption and salvation on offer through faith in Christ, in whose name we pray, amen and amen. Paul says this to the uh, if the church at Ephesus and to us by extension, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. And verse three, among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Isn't that interesting that he, he says there are lusts of the flesh and desires of the mind as well. Uh, that's really fascinating to me. It's not just all about the physical. Uh, there's a lot that goes on right up here, isn't there? Um, he says, among them too, we too all formerly lived in lust, in the lusts of our flesh, indul indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Wow. All right. So that's our three verses for today. Hopefully you've, uh, as I say, got a copy of it somewhere, or perhaps uh, when you get to where you're going, you can, you can pull up uh, a copy of those verses and take another look at them. Um, he talks in the past tense, and that's one of the reasons why um, I, I love this chapter for its before and after. And uh, he's helping us look back to see, you know, kind of what's gone wrong, what, what's gone wrong with the world. Uh, and it's, uh, some of you have heard me mention this before, but it's long been rumored that the uh, uh, the English writer G.K. Chesterton, along with several other writers of his time, uh, were once asked uh, to write an essay answering the question, what is wrong with the world? And the rumor, and we can't find the documentation for it, but it's been so often quoted that uh, a lot of people believe it to be true. The rumor is that Chesterton wrote back and responded to the, uh, the editor of The Times. It was The Times that had evidently asked for these essays to be written on what's wrong with the world. And Chesterton, with his classic self-deprecating humility and wit, is reported to have offered his pithy answer, just using two words, uh, in quotes, these are my air quotes, okay. I am, what's wrong with the world? I am. All right, so here we find uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, before Chesterton, saying essentially the same thing. What's wrong with the world? We are. And uh, what's wrong is that uh, at least three things here, um, we were dead in our trespasses and sin. We were enslaved uh, by our uh, fleshly, and, uh, fleshly lusts and the powers uh, at work against us uh, according to the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. And then we were condemned as well. So we were dead, we were enslaved, and we were condemned. All of this before faith in Christ. But Chesterton is onto something, and the Apostle Paul um, certainly is right at the center of what the Bible teaches for us here, is that there is indeed something wrong with the human person. As a matter of fact, it goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. Um, and in the book of Genesis, we find right after the creation event, we have the record of how sin entered the world. And the first humans basically disregarding God, disregarding God's word, um, were, were deceived into uh, the thought that they could be their own God, that they could be equal with God, that they could have the final word, that they could be the arbiters of what is right, what is wrong, the ones who decided what is true, what is false. Sin, you see, is rebellion. 
Um, it is exchanging uh, uh, God or our creator for something in the creation ourselves included. And our first parents, Adam and Eve, they basically disregarded God. They chose to go their own way. They set themselves up as, as the final authority. And what's wonderful all, uh, is, is that that's, that's news that runs from the beginning all the way through to the end in the book of Revelation. But all through what's in between there, we have the story of God's rescue mission. Um, God on the move, rolling up his sleeves, coming on a rescue mission to save us, to redeem us from ourselves. Um, there's a, an Australian uh, professor uh, who has written a book called Biblical Critical Theory, the subtitle, I love the subtitle, How the Bible's Unfolding Story Makes Sense of Modern Life and Culture. I mean, that's, I just gotta, I gotta read you that again, because that's, that's a great book, it's, it, it, and it's a great title. Uh, Biblical Critical Theory, that means thinking critically um, uh, about all of life from the Bible's perspective, okay? Uh, the subtitle, How the Bible's Unfolding Story Makes Sense of Modern Life and Culture. All right, so basically it's how the Bible makes sense of, look at all the big questions we've already dealt with here in the book of Ephesians. You know, All the way back to our first study, who am I? The Apostle Paul um, speaking so clearly and comprehensively about he, he knew who he was, and it's so refreshing to read that, who he was by the will of God, not by his own choosing, not by the culture's influence, not by online people sort of you know swaying him, influencing him in some way. No, he knew who he was because he knew the Lord who made him, and he turned to God for the answers to the biggest questions. And I love uh, Christopher Watkins' book, for that as it describes how we should think critically about all of life through the lens of the Bible and its view. Well, here's my quote from Christopher Watkin that I think applies to this particular uh, passage, these three verses that we've uh, just read from Ephesians chapter two. Watkin says this, the Bible offers a range of images to help us understand different facets of the reality of sin. Sin is lawlessness, sin is rebellion, Sin is exchanging God for something created. Sin is transgressing a limit. The church has also tried to understand all sins as flowing from a common source. For Augustine, Augustine rather, for example, pride is, a, is at the origin of all sin. C.S. Lewis says the same thing. Pride is at the center of all my sin. Among these different ways of understanding sin, says Christopher Watkin, the one upon which I want to dwell in the light of Genesis 3, and that's where the fall of mankind is, is listed and described there. The one that I want to dwell on in the light of Genesis 3 is that sin called autonomy. Oh, now he's really on to something for me anyway. I think that just really says it all. I want to be left alone. I want to be my own God, essentially, is what he's saying. Autonomy. This false idea that I don't need anyone else, that I can actually handle the weight of being the one to decide what's right and wrong. The weight of being the one to determine reality itself. And that's the greatest lie uh, that has just continued to be told over and over and over and over again, all the way since back in the garden in Genesis chapter three. Um, I love what Watkins says there, I commend his book to you. We've all seen before and after photos of someone who's gotten himself in excellent physical shape or perhaps uh, a new wardrobe, you know, a makeover for their wardrobe, or maybe they had their hair cut differently and all of a sudden just, you know, took on a whole new look. I think Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 that we've read today is the ultimate description of our spiritual before portrait. Um, it's what we were like before Christ. And, and here are those three things again, because I think this is really important. Before Christ, we were spiritually dead in our trespasses 
and sins. We weren't spiritually ill. We weren't spiritually fuzzy. We weren't spiritually weak. No, no, we were spiritually dead in our trespasses and sin. No signs of life, no ability to think, no ability to to weigh things out, no ability to see things clearly. Um, We were dead in our trespasses and sin. Secondly, before Christ, we were literally the walking dead because while we were dead in our trespasses and sin, he goes on in verse two to say, in which you formerly walked. See, we were dead men walking is really what we were. We were walking dead people, uh, walking around like zombies, basically enslaved or um, uh, following the course of those walking dead, you know, those who were spiritually dead in their trespasses and sin. Um, he uses the terms here, following the kingdom uh, or the or the prince of the power of the air, if you will, or uh, the the the. the uh, the devil essentially is what Paul is saying here. He, he's not shy to talk about Satan. He's not shy to talk about the devil or the fact that there's a, a, a force like that in this world. And we should not be shy about that either. Um, we, uh, before Christ, deceived by Satan, deluded by the self. Before Christ, walking according to this world systems as well as our own fleshly lusts, our own passions and desires, sometimes of the heart, sometimes of the body, sometimes of the mind. Um, The ego, uh, certainly all a part of that. Ego is, uh, for some, I've heard it said before, is an acronym for edging God out uh, because you're wanting to put the self in the center. Before Christ, we were spiritually dead. Before Christ, uh, we were the walking dead, if you will. We were enslaved to uh, our sin. And then thirdly, before Christ, we were condemned. We were, right here it says in verse three, we, it, we were by nature children of wrath, um, God's wrath. Um, this is not just a capricious God that woke up grumpy and is upset because he just was moody and didn't get enough breakfast or coffee or something. No, this is a God who has a settled opposition against evil and all that is wicked and works against him in, throughout reality and throughout creation. So condemned objects of God's wrath. Uh, let's just say that's not a good thing. Uh, it's not a vague thing either. For far too long, I think we've We've slid into sort of a softening of the reality of our true situation and the gravity of our true situation. And if we will not have an honest diagnosis for what is wrong with us, as G.K. Chesterton says, I, I'm what's wrong with me. Um, if we won't have a real honest diagnosis of that, we'll never find the right solution for what is wrong with us. Now, with all of that very real uh, and very bad news, that is not at all fake news. Whatever you do, do not miss the next episode of this podcast because it begins with two words in verse four with all that bad news, but God, dot, dot, dot. And I'll just leave it there and invite you to join me. Lord, thank you for today. Uh, And while this, these first three verses Uh, maybe a rude awakening for some, Uh, I pray that the uh, truth would set us free, Uh, not just set us up to be autonomous. I don't think we ultimately really want that, Lord. We don't want to be left alone. We don't like unbelonging. Our deepest longing is for belonging, to belong to you and to belong to others, to know what it means to both love and be loved. And thank you that you know us completely and love us completely, Lord. How amazing that is. Look forward to verse four and what's to come and what you have done for us in Christ. And in his name we pray and give thanks. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thanks for listening to today's study. Take a moment to leave a review and share this episode with friends and family. You can stay connected by signing up for our TVC Resources newsletter or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. At The Village Chapel, we believe God's Word is unique in its source, timeless in its truth, broad in its reach, and transforming in its power. For more resources or to support our ministry, visit our website, thevillagechapel.com.